Rabbi Tovia Singer is one of today's leading counter missionaries, and on his YouTube channel, his most viewed debate is his debate with Reverend Jim Cantlin, who is one of the founders of the Christian community in Jerusalem called King of Kings. Now, during the debate, the resurrection of Jesus came up, and I'm going to play a clip from this exchange so you could see what Rabbi Singer's view is on this issue. Then later, I'll introduce you to an Orthodox Jewish scholar whose arguments really present a challenge to Rabbi Singer's view on the resurrection of Jesus. But I don't want to spoil this, so let's go ahead and get right into this. So you're saying this didn't happen in history? No, absolutely not. Well, see, that, 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 okay, here, here's a line of demarcation. Uh, I believe that the resurrection of Christ is the greatest historical event of all time. But that's because you believe, not a historical event, no, no, you come believe on. There's in the New Testament. There's more evidence for the resurrection, not from biblical sources, but from extra-biblical sources. And like just from what? History. What's from one extra-biblical uh, well, source for the resurrection? Well, I mean, the... the um, one. Oh, okay, you got me there. No, they, if you say there's more, well, how could you say there's more and not have any? There are none. No. That means, let me tell you why. It's, it's, it's not, but... The, Christians you, believe you've got the whole because world they believe pivoting. in the New Testament. No, 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 you've got the whole world pivoting around this empty grave. You know, all, all, the, all the disciples had, or all the Roman officials had to do was produce the body, and Christianity would have been, would have been nipped in the bud. How do you know didn't produce a body? Oh. I'll tell you why. Because you, a priori, believe in the New Testament as the Word of God. You know, when Paul in 2 Timothy 3.16 said that all Scripture is inspired, there was no New Testament when he said that. He was speaking about the Jewish Bible, yeah, not about the yeah, Christian yeah, Bible. Yeah. You know, the reason why Christians believe in the resurrection is one reason. It's because they want to believe it based on what the New Testament says. Because if it didn't happen, then um, they, there's nothing to their Christianity. What was it that changed this, uh, this group of uh, uh, frightened disciples hiding out at the crucifixion into the aggressive band of preachers they became if it wasn't for the resurrection? That's only if you believe in the stories of the New Testament that they were a bunch of, Why were they frightened, by the way? What were they so scared about? I mean, when, when Jesus says they he's going to They thought they'd get crucified too. Really? Well, no, Jesus sure. didn't teach them to do no. that. You know why they were frightened? They were frightened because perhaps they had no idea. You know, I would say this. You know, if I already believe in the New Testament and I say this is an accurate record of history, well, then I'm a Christian. I don't. What I do is say, I say, I have to take an honest approach. I love God. I love Hashem with all my heart, soul, and mind. I want to serve Him. I want to know what is His will. And then I say, okay, here's the teaching of Christianity. Are these teachings congruent or are they incongruent with those teachings? After studying the Christian Bible very carefully, I've concluded without any question that this is not a record of history, that Jesus is not the Messiah, and therefore it's important for the world to, to understand about the one God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to retrieve Jews from the church. I, I, the reason why you believe it is because you believe in the New Testament. I have to admit, Reverend Cantillon's arguments were really weak. He built his case on an unsupported assertion that there's more evidence for the resurrection, not from biblical sources, but from extra biblical sources. And Rabbi Singer called him out on this point. And when I first saw this, it was, it was really hard to watch. But I also think Rabbi Singer's arguments fail as well. Think about what he said. He said, I have to take an honest approach. I love God. I love Hashem with all my heart, soul, and might. I want to serve Him. I want to know what is His will. And then I say, okay, here's the teaching of Christianity. Are these teachings congruent or are they incongruent with those teachings? After studying the Christian Bible very carefully, I've concluded without any question that this is not a record of history, that Jesus is not the Messiah. And then he goes on to say, the reason why you believe it is because you believe in the New Testament. So it sounds like Rabbi Singer is saying that he has determined the New Testament is not a record of history because its teachings are not congruent with the teachings found in the Torah. Now, he doesn't say Torah explicitly here, but when you keep watching the discussion on the resurrection, you'll see that Rabbi Singer attempts to show that the teaching of Christianity contradicts the teachings found in the Torah. So, as I'm understanding Rabbi Singer, he's saying that in order to view the New Testament as a record of history, one must determine whether the teachings found in the text are congruent with the Torah. So from Rabbi Singer's perspective, if the teachings in the New Testament are not congruent with the Torah, then the text is not a record of history, which means there's no evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. Okay, so I just want to say this. This is not how the discipline of history is conducted.
Historians don't approach a text and decide whether it is a historical record on the basis of whether its claims are compatible with the historian's religious view. To put it another way, was Pontius Pilate a historical figure? Was John the Baptist a person that existed in history? Did Pharisees believe in the resurrection of the dead? Rabbi Singer does not dispute that the answer to each of these questions is yes. The first century Jewish historian Josephus speaks of these things, and so does the New Testament. Jewish scholar Dr. Amy Jill Levine, who teaches at Vanderbilt University, says this, The New Testament preserves for the Jewish community part of our own history that we don't have. Jesus, Mary Magdalene, Jesus' mother, James, Paul, they're all Jews. The only Pharisee from whom we have written records is Paul of Tarsus. The first person in history ever called rabbi in a literary text is Jesus of Nazareth. If I want to understand Galilean life in the first century, other than archaeology, I have no better source than the Gospels. Also in the Jewish Annotated New Testament, which she co-edited with Dr. Mark Brettler, who teaches at Duke University, these scholars said this, It is our hope as well that in reading the Gospels, all readers of whatever religious background can recover the Jewish history embedded in them. Rabbi Singer seems to be saying that we should not view the New Testament as a record of history unless it is compatible with his religious views. But the point that Dr. Levine and Dr. Brettler are making is that despite one's religious views, one should see the Jewish history contained in the New Testament. And to quote another scholar, to quote another Jewish scholar, Dr. Pamela Eisenbaum, who teaches at Denver University, she says this in her book, Paul Was Not a Christian. She says, Acts constitutes an undeniable part of the historical record that can be mined for information about the origins of Christianity generally, as well as some of its central figures, like Paul. As long as it is used with awareness of its literary tendencies and particular bias, this is true of ancient and modern accounts of events. Listen again to what she says there. Acts constitutes an undeniable part of the historical record. She uses almost the same language as Rabbi Singer and comes to the opposite conclusion. Dr. Eisenbaum sees Acts as a record of history. I also want to highlight another scholar. When I was in San Diego at the Society of Biblical Literature Conference in 2019, I was able to attend a panel session with Orthodox Jewish historian Dr. Daniel Boyarin, who teaches at UC Berkeley, and this is what he said during the panel. Jews frequently complain that Christians have hijacked the Old Testament from us. It's the New Testament that's been hijacked. All those texts can productively be read as part of Jewish history. Again, he is an Orthodox Jew. He doesn't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. But like Dr. Levine and other Jewish scholars, he recognizes that the New Testament is a record of history. And more specifically, he says it's part of Jewish history. The comments made by Dr. Levine, Dr. Brettler, Dr. Eisenbaum, and Dr. Boyarin all show that even Jewish historians do not approach the New Testament by first seeing whether its teachings are compatible with their religious views in order for them to view it as a record of history. For them, the New Testament is a valuable ancient source that contains Jewish history. And as I said earlier, I want to present the views of one Orthodox Jewish scholar in particular because I think his arguments directly challenge Rabbi Tovia Singer's points on the resurrection of Jesus in this debate. This is the late Dr. Pincus Lapid. He was an Orthodox Jewish scholar and rabbi who taught at Bar Ilan University in Israel. He wrote the book, The Resurrection of Jesus, A Jewish Perspective. And the question I want to ask is, what would Dr. Lapid say to Rabbi Singer? Dr. Lapid was not a Christian apologist, he was not a Messianic Jew, he didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, and yet he concluded his study of the evidence by saying that the resurrection of Jesus was an event that occurred in history. So let's dive right into the evidence that led him to this conclusion. And for Dr. Lapid, it was two historical facts that were key. One is that Jesus' tomb was empty, and two is that the disciples of Jesus had experiences that they believed were appearances of the risen Jesus. Let's look at Dr. Lapid's reasons for why he accepted the New Testament's claim that Jesus' tomb was empty. Dr. Lapid says this, According to all four Gospels, women are the first ones to find the tomb of Jesus open and empty. 
In a purely fictional narrative, one would have avoided making women the crown witnesses of the resurrection since they were considered in rabbinic Judaism as incapable of giving valid testimony. So let's look at a couple of examples he cites. He quotes from a midrash on Judges 13 verse 8 that speaks of the promise that Samson will be born. And this is what the text says. Manoah said to the angel, until now I have heard it from the women that I am to have a son, but one cannot rely on the words of women. But now the word may come from your mouth. I would like to hear it because I do not trust her words. Perhaps she has changed or omitted or added something. Dr. Lapide points out on the basis of Sarah denying laughing when she was promised a son in Genesis 18 verse 5, that it was taught in Yahut Shimoni 182 that women are unable to give testimony in court. And the exception for this rule is described in the Babylonian Talmud Rosh Hashanah 22a, which says this, A woman is unfit to give testimony, although in certain cases a woman's testimony is accepted, example, to testify to the death of someone's husband. In the majority of cases, her testimony is not valid. So according to Rosh Hashanah 22a, female testimony is only accepted in a court when a man dies. A woman can testify to this so that his widow was allowed to marry again. And when it comes to the Gospels, Dr. Lapide says this great line, It had to strike the disciples as irony that here women wanted to testify to the opposite, namely the resurrection of a dead person. Also thinking about this, how did the male disciples respond when these female witnesses arrived to tell them what happened? Well, Luke 24 verse 11 says this, These words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Dr. Lapide also notes that the Gospels do not say that the discoverer of the empty tomb brought the disciples to faith in Jesus' resurrection. In, in fact, Dr. Lapide compares the reports found in the post-canonical authors, by which he's referring to the non-canonical Gospels, such as the Gospel of Peter, and he argues that unlike those books, the New Testament testifies to an honesty in reporting the events. So let's look at how the Gospel of Peter, which was written in the second century, let's see how this text reports the empty tomb account. But in the night in which the Lord's day dawned, when the soldiers were safeguarding it two by two in every watch, there was a loud voice in heaven, and they saw that the heavens were open, and that two males who had much radiance had come down from there and come near the sepulchre. But that stone which had been thrust against the door, having rolled by itself, went a distance off the side, and the sepulchre opened, and both the young men entered. And so those soldiers, having seen, awakened the centurion and the elders, for they too were present, safeguarding. And while they were relating what they had seen, again they see three males who have come out from the sepulchre, with two supporting the other one, and a cross following them, and the head of the two reaching unto heaven, but that of the one being led out by a hand by them going beyond the heavens. And they were hearing a voice from the heavens saying, Have you made proclamation to the fallen asleep? And an obeisance was heard from the cross, yes. Now at the dawn of the Lord's day, Mary Magdalene, a female disciple of the Lord, having taken with her women friends, came to the tomb where he had been placed. And having gone off, they found the sepulchre open, and having come forward, they bent down there, and saw there a certain young man seated in the middle of the sepulchre, comely and clothed with a splendid robe, who said to them, Why have you come? Whom do you seek? Not that one who was crucified, he is risen and gone away. But if you do not believe, bend down and see the place where he lay, because he is not here, for he is risen and gone away, to there whence he was sent. Then the women fled, frightened." Here in the Gospel of Peter, the account narrates that the soldiers guarding the tomb were the ones who witnessed the resurrection event. The stone moves on its own, two angels take Jesus out of the tomb, their heads reach into the heaven, then Jesus' head goes beyond the heavens, there's a loud voice from the heavens informing the guards that they failed to guard the tomb, and then the cross even talks to the witnesses of the resurrection event. And None of this takes place in the New Testament Gospels. Also in this story, the women who go to the tomb don't even check inside the tomb to see whether it's empty. They run away afraid, and Mary never goes to tell the male disciples what happened. The only people to report the empty tomb and the resurrection are men. Now, listen to what Lapide says about the difference between the text like the Gospel of Peter and the accounts found in the New Testament Gospels. 
This is what he says. We do not read in the Gospels of an apocalyptic spectacle, exorbitant sensations, or of transforming impact of a cosmic event. Instead of an exciting Easter jubilation, we hear repeatedly of doubts, disbelief, hesitation, and such simple things as the linen cloths and the napkins in the empty tomb, of a race to the tomb which ends as idling in such sober statements as, for instance, then the disciples went back to their homes, John 20 verse 10, or Peter ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in, he went home, Luke 24 verse 12, and they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had come upon them, Mark 16 verse 8. It sounds as if any jubilant outburst should be dampened, more covered than uncovered, and as if the truth of the event needed no emphasis. Reading the Gospels with this Jewish context, understanding the perception of female testimony, and the mundane honesty in which the Gospels report its discovery, even by the men, has convinced Dr. Lapide that Jesus' tomb really was empty. What about the disciples' experiences of seeing Jesus alive after his death? How does Dr. Lapide know that is historical? Well, he examines a primary text found in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 through 5, and this is what it says. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Messiah died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Paul says that he delivered what he received, and according to Dr. Lapide, Paul is telling the truth here. And we know that Paul is quoting Jewish oral tradition that he received from the first witnesses of the risen Jesus. Now, Dr. Lapide supports his claim by listing eight linguistic items found in this text. And I'm going to read those for you here. The vocabulary, sentence structure, and diction are clearly unpauline. The parallelism of the three individual statements is biblically formulated. The threefold and that characterizes the Aramaic and Mishnaic Hebrew way of narration. The divine passive of being raised paraphrases God's action of salvation in order not to mention God in accordance with the Jewish fear of the name. The Aramaic form of the name Cephas, not Simon, as Luke gives it in the parallel passage 2434, sounds more original. The double reference, in accordance with the scriptures, supports twice in three lines both the death and the resurrection of Jesus, as it probably corresponds with the faithfulness of the early church to the Hebrew Bible. The twelve as a closed group of the first witnesses includes also Judas. This both agrees with the consciousness of Jesus to be sent to all of Israel, and contradicts the supposed suicide of Judas, Matthew 27, verse 5. Finally, the statement, which in its basic features is repeated almost in all later reports of the resurrection, narrates the course of four events which were understood as salvation-bearing. He died for our sins, was buried, and appeared. On the basis of this evidence, Dr. Lapide says, This formula of faith may be considered a statement of eyewitnesses, for whom the experience of the resurrection became the turning point of their lives. This is the earliest evidence of eyewitness testimony, and Dr. Lapide also considers the New Testament gospel accounts to have a level of trustworthiness. This is what he says, According to all New Testament reports, no human eye saw the resurrection itself. No human being was present and none of the disciples asserted to have apprehended, let alone understood, its manner and nature, how easy it would have been for them, or their immediate successors, to supplement this scandalous whole in the concatenation of events by fanciful embellishments. But precisely because none of the evangelists dared to improve upon or embellish this unseen resurrection, the total picture of the Gospels also gains in trustworthiness. Okay, so Dr. Lapide argues that the evidence found in the New Testament literature is strong enough to show that Jesus' tomb was empty and his disciples had experiences of seeing Jesus alive after his death. Now, Dr. Lapide doesn't jump from we have these facts to God raised Jesus from the dead. He sees that it is necessary to address alternative naturalistic explanations, and specifically he addresses the explanation that the disciples were actually just experiencing visions of Jesus. For Dr. Lapide, this does not account for the evidence, and here's why. In all the examples he could cite in the Talmud of people having this kind of experience, such as disciples dreaming of their dead master, or a woman speaking to her dead husband in a vision, 
He points out that in each of these cases, there is no essential change that occurs in the life of those having such experiences as a result. And this is totally unlike the disciples. This is what he says. When this scared band of apostles, which was just about to throw away everything in order to flee in despair to Galilee, when these peasants, shepherds, and fishermen, who betrayed and denied their master and then failed him miserably, suddenly could be changed overnight into a confident mission society, convinced of salvation, and able to work with much more success after Easter than before Easter, then no such vision or hallucination is sufficient to explain such a revolutionary transformation. Dr. Lapide concludes his study of the historical evidence by stating this, In regard to the future resurrection of the dead, I am and remain a Pharisee. Concerning the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Sunday, I was for decades a Sadducee. I am no longer a Sadducee. I accept the resurrection of Jesus, not as an invention of the community of disciples, but as a historical event. So there it is. I think if Rabbi Tovia Singer pressed Dr. Lapid with his argument that you cannot grant that Jesus rose from the dead because the New Testament is theologically unacceptable to the Jew, Rabbi Lapid would say something to the effect of, I beg to differ. Again, Dr. Lapid was not a Messianic Jew, he was an Orthodox Jew, and the very fact that he pursued this historical investigation of Jesus' resurrection shows his disagreement with Rabbi Singer. Of course, as a Messianic Jew, I think Dr. Lapid is right that Jesus did rise from the dead. I also think he's right that we should not allow our religious views to stop us from looking at a text to discover whether the historical claims that it makes are actually true. In fact, I think the great Jewish philosopher Maimonides put it so well when he said, You should listen to the truth, whoever may have said it. Dr. Lapide's work is a demonstration that he lived out this principle, because while he did not accept Jesus' messiahship or divinity, he still granted, on the basis of the evidence, that the claim the New Testament makes of what happened after Jesus' death is true. He rose from the dead. And I want to ask you, what do you think of Rabbi Tovia Singer's view? What do you think of Dr. Pincus Lapid's view? Should we allow our religious views to determine whether we can view the New Testament as a record of history? What do you think of Dr. Lapid's case for the resurrection of Jesus? Let me know in the comments below. If you're on YouTube and you've enjoyed the content, or even if you just found this challenging, be sure to like, subscribe, and click the notification bell so you can be updated on new videos. If you're listening to the podcast, please subscribe. And if you want to see how I address Dr. Lapid's argument for why he thinks Jesus' resurrection does not mean that he is the Messiah, check out my video where I do just that. Thank you for joining me and see you next time.